Hi, welcome to the Rocks Film Festival Daily Script Reads. Today, we're going to be uh, reading a script by um, Kevin. I will introduce uh, Kevin. You introduce yourself. Our writer. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for um, uh, allowing me to have this moment. Good luck, guys. Enjoy the deal. Thank you, Kevin. Okay. Um, and we have a bevy of actors here. Um, Kevin, you can, um, thank you. Uh, Daniel. Hello, my name is Daniel Callahan and I will be playing Six Pack, Bellhop and Cliff. Thank you. David. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, David J. Curtis and I'll be playing Two Jobs, Butler Two and Desk Clerk. Great. And um, David and, and Daniel, we'll see you later when you're reading. Thank you. Um, Denise. Hi, I'm Denise Lopes, and I'll be playing Robin. Great. Um, Deanna. Hi, my name is Deanna, and I'm going to be playing Betty, Mrs. Neal, slash Angela, and Stagehand. Thank you. Naheem. Hi, Naheem Garcia. I'll be playing Sam Scott. Thank you. John? Hello, everyone. My name is John Brownlee. I'll be playing Reggie and Raymond. Thank you. Uh, Otis? Hi, my name is Otis Spencer. I'll be playing Chuck and Charles. Great. Christopher? Oh, my name is Chris James, and I'll be playing Wow, a baby. Be Mr. Russo, Kool-Aid, Ben, Baby Boy, and the newscaster. Wow, lots. We'll see, be seeing a lot of uh, Christopher in different hats. And um, Joshua? Hey everybody, my name is Joshua Olumide. I'll be playing James. Great. And we have, um, I'm sorry, Chris. Hello, folks. I'm Chris Everett. I'll be your narrator and also a talk show, talk show host. Great. Here we go. The Deal by Kevin Mapplemore. Interior. James's Kitchen. Night. Robin is dragging James back into the party. He stares in disbelief. Six Pack has a group around the fireplace listening to one of his outrageous tales. James has already told Robin about Raymond's good fortune. She can't wait to tell their guests. Excuse me, please. James has something he wants to share with us. I'll uh, make this short. I've never been good at public speaking or being in front of a lot of people, but thanks to my closest friends and all of you. This is a night I will never forget. I just got off the phone with Chuck, Raymond's agent, and he said they made him an offer. They want Raymond to appear on some big talk show ASAP. Are they giving the kid a deal? Congratulations to you and Ray. You know, out on the coast, everything goes. I think this calls for a toast. <laughs> Robin wanders off, playing the perfect hostess, leaving James with two jobs. Don't look so thrilled. The way I see it, you got everything you asked for. You got the girl, now the deal. Cheers. I thought it would feel different. You don't have to stay till the end. It's, it's your show, so... You can get out anytime you please. And what will Robin think? You're asking the wrong person. You know me. And women are a bad mix. I like my fun. <laughs> <laughs> I take it she still doesn't know how you feel about it. You can take this for what it's worth. If you care about her the way you say, you better tell her sooner than later. Merry Christmas, my brother. 
Interior, Studio 5. Day. James stands backstage with Raymond and Chuck by his side. A stagehand shows Raymond his mark. At this point, Chuck has taken total control over Raymond. Stagehand and talk show host appear in the scene. On five, four, three. Welcome everybody, I'm Richard Rose. Today, we have a singing sensation, Brady, who is making his first national TV appearance at age 17. We also have screenwriter Raymond Neal from Cleveland, Ohio. Hope you enjoy the show. We'll be right back with our first guest, Raymond Neal. That's your cue. The stagehand stands back with Chuck and James. James is focused on Raymond's interview, the kid handling it like a pro. The stagehand is curious about James's presence. So you're his agent, huh? So who's he? The kid's roadie. Exterior, James's house two days later. James stands waiting for a smiling Mr. Russo as he heads up the walk with hands in his mail pouch. I believe I have a little Christmas cheer for you. Merry Christmas. <laughs> you shouldn't have. Don't worry, I didn't. This came too. James gives a long, hard look at the bill. Mr. Russo blows warm air in his hands as he gives James a hard look of concern. Aren't you gonna take care of that? James opens the first letter. It's a very big check. Mr. Russo looks at the numbers. Wow. Somebody must have died. <laughs> Worse, it's from Chuck. It says we've been invited to a New Year's party in LA to sign the deal. First class plane tickets are in the mail. Signed, best wishes, Chuck. Just that Chuck is not so bad after all. <laughs> Interior, mall jewelry store, day. A salesman is showing James diamond rings. James pulls, James pulls three envelopes from his breast pocket. One is marked Raymond. The other two are marked bad. And what about that one? Well, that much? Two carrots. If she won't take it, I will. I'll take it. James removes money from the envelope marked bank. And a little later, we see him walking out to another store with a much bigger bag. Interior, Cleveland International Airport, day. James and Raymond are waiting on board their plane. Betty and Kool-Aid. It's busy and people are constantly bumping into them as they say their farewells. Well, I guess this is it. I guess it is. James goes to hug his friends. We pan on each one as they say goodbye to James and Raymond. This is what you work for. What, what can I say? It's about friendship, nothing more. This is all for us, for all of us. We, we pan over on Raymond and Kool-Aid as the final boarding call is announced. First out of the hood, first on a plane, now Hollywood. You, my boy. Don't let anybody tell you different and say what's up to Eddie and Denzel if you meet them. Yo, age, you're my boy always, just like this. Ain't nothing ever gonna come between us. Fame, chicks, nothing. Nothing but Halle Berry or J-Lo. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> Final boarding call, flight 350, leaving Cleveland for LA. Ah, that's us. But before we go, I've got a little something for you. James hands each one a package. He gives Raymond a new laptop. 
maybe this will make whatever you've been writing easier. Thanks, but you, sh you shouldn't have. James turns to Robin with a small box in his hand. I know this isn't the most romantic place. I know what you've been through, but I wanted to... James? Say yes. Say yes so brother won't miss his plane. <laughs> I'll wear it, but we need to talk first. But I guess, yes. <laughs> James and Robin kiss as six pack cheers and holds his refound six pack in the air. Yo, six, man, what's with the six pack? Rewrite, my brother. Just like life, rewrites. Ugh, I think I'm gonna be sick. <laughs> Interior, LAX airport, day. James and Raymond are coming out of the tunnel. Ben and Charles, two very well-dressed men, are waiting from Universal World Studios. Here's the use to it. Soon this will be your town. Everything here answers Universal World Studios. I made some arrangement for you to do a little shopping. You know, let the locals uh, know who the new kid is in town. You may be asked to sign some autographs, take some photos, sign all you want, but try not to get too overwhelmed by the paparazzi. It's just a photo and, and your freedom. That's, that's, that's okay. We don't, we don't need all that. It's all on the studio. No strings. James and Raymond exit, exit the limousine. They're overcome by the lights from the cameras and the screaming teenage girls trying to touch Raymond anywhere they can. The studio's publicity department has arranged all of this. Raymond eats up this attention. James gets pushed to the background. As they exit a leather shop, Ben and Charles give James all, all Raymond's new clothes, treating him like a roadie. Interior, Hollywood Suite Hotel, day. James is amazed by the luxuries in his room. On the table next to his king-size bed, there's a beautiful fruit basket. And next to it is a chilled bottle of the Valley's best red wine. In the bathroom hangs the signature robe. Always wanted one of these. Why, you might ask? It's because it's the best. Maybe I should put this somewhere where it won't get too wrinkled. James walks out of the bathroom into his suite and begins neatly stuffing the robe inside his suitcase. There's a knock at the door. Expecting to see Raymond, he opens the door with a casual attitude. He is disappointed to discover Chuck. James sees him and walks Well, I'm happy to see you too. Well, I'm happy to see you too. My brother gives me the, my mother gives me the same look. Nice. nice. Now, now tell, tell me, me, is this living or what? I haven't been here in years. Chuck walks through the room like he owns it. He stops and looks out the window. Did you see this view? You know, back in the day, this room was the size of my apartment. I didn't even get a chance to use the bathroom. I had to go down the hall to do my business. Hated that. One of my neighbors was always in there all the time, you know, had a case of the Hershey squirts. <laughs> hey, do they still have those nice bathrobes? I said the next time I stayed here, I was going to swipe one. James stands in the doorway of the bathroom, blocking Chuck's way. Yeah, hey, I'm not that kind of guy. What about the contract? Where's the kid? That's, that's not the answer I was looking for. Oh, what's this? Attitude? You know, just between you and me, you're selfish. Never once did you ever say thank you for all that I've done for you. And do you ever hear any attitude from Chuck? No. No, I just do what's best for my client. Remember, I'm the one that got you here. And before the night is over, I think you need to give some hard thought and to just how thankful you should be when the deal goes down because attitude with Chuck will just give you nothing but gas. I'm his manager. 
Chuck takes an apple from the fruit basket, eats, and talks at the same time. For the record, Raymond is my client, and you, my friend, are just a fan. A hanger on. <laughs> Need I go on? The contract is simple. Oh, I love these Granny Smiths. Excuse me, food and me, you know. Now, this is Raymond's first deal. So everything is going to be real simple like. Payment is in three parts. Now, maybe when the deal happens, Raymond gets a fee as a consultant because they may want to bring on a named writer, you know, and uh, put on a real package, flat fee for foreign rights. They get a star and go to the movies and a story. Next deal, simple. If things would be, it would just settle better if I could sit and look at things, you know, just look things over. I don't like walking through closed doors. Yeah, it looks like rain. It never rains in LA. Chuck begins to walk out of the room. James grabs his arm. Hey, I will see the contract. You will at the right time. Only a fool will sign a contract with Rio without reading it first. You give me a little, uh, let me give you a little healthy advice. The next time you put your hands on Chuck Berry, don't. Interior, Raymond's hotel room, Dag. James enters Raymond's room, the opulent surroundings dumbfounded. And so think I wanted to give you my room. <laughs> Did you know this is Bakra? I, I I can't spell it, but but if it costs anything close to what that rope cost, you better make sure it doesn't. You don't get a case of the drops. You break it, it comes out of your cup. Capiche? There's a knock at the door. James is still talking. Raymond answers it. The bellhop rolls in a cart with lunch. Sorry, Chuck came by and had his lunch sent up. He said this is only the beginning of what's to come. You know, you should. Chill with Chuck. I think you should cut him some slack. He's not such a bad guy once you get to know him. Uh, enjoy your lunch. I think I need some air. Interior, James's hotel room, day. James returns to his room to discover a dozen long stem roses resting on the table. Just as he starts to read the card, the phone rings. I love you, sweetheart. Interior. Limo outside the hotel, day. We see baby brother, the limo driver, as he talks to James on the car phone. Well, I love you too, sir. But what time should I pick you and Mr. Neil up tonight? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I thought you were somewhere else. Um, is 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 nine okay? Nine? Where are you from, sir? Cleveland, why? It's just that at these big Hollywood affairs, the important people like to make their own entrance. And the only people that show up about nine is the help. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, so what time do all the important people show up? Hmm, how about I pick you up about 11? 11, that's fine. James hangs up the phone and calls down to the front desk. Hello, uh, will you hold all my calls till 7? Thank you. Knock at the door. James dashes towards the door and picks up some fruit. He thinks it's Chuck. As he opens the door, he's prepared to hit Chuck as soon as he enters. He catches himself as the door opens and it's the bellhop. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I thought you were someone else. I have your tuxedos. Uh-oh. Uh oh what? I I'm sorry, I must have mixed this up. I, I have two tuxedos in your name, but the room numbers are different. Oh, there's, there's no mistake. This is my room and the other one is my brother's. I'll just take both. Sorry, dude, I, no can do. I'm, I must make my deliveries in person. Okay, that's fine with me, just trying to help. James is about to walk away when he notices the bellhop 
standing there with his hand out. I was instructed to tell you that these were compliments from the studio. Uh, tell them thanks and compliments to them too. <laughs> he attempts to close the door, but the bellhop's foot is in the way. The tip! <laughs> well, okay, I forgot. I don't get to do this much. Uh, here. Thanks. Hand down to the bellhop's hand. He puts the dollar in his pocket and holds out his hand again. James places another dollar in his hand and smiles. You're not from around here, are you? Let me guess. Cleveland. Wow. Uh, how did you do that? <laughs> Bellhop stuffs the buck back in James's pocket and exits. Exterior hallway outside Raymond's room, day. The bellhop knocks on Raymond's door. The room opens. The bellhop begins to talk. He then notices that Raymond is black. He does a double take. I have a tux for his brother. Is he here? Uh, yeah, that must be me. That's your brother? If, if he says so, then we're family. Raymond takes the tux and then attempts to close the door, but the bellhop's foot is blocking the doorway. Yo, homeboy, what's up with the foot? It's customary here at the Hollywood Hotel that one tips for our service. Want a tip? Move your foot, Holmes. Raymond slams the door on his foot. Exterior car scene, night. The camera follows the limo as it travels through Beverly Hills. The car's the car pulls off Wilshire Boulevard into the driveway of the Sam Scott, the famous Hollywood director. James and Raymond exit the car, both dressed in black tuxes. At the door, a well-dressed, gray-haired old man, checking off the names on a guest list, greets them. To whom may I say? James Anthony and Raymond Neal. Um, no, James Anthony. I. I I don't see it. Oh, oh, here, uh, Mr. Raymond Neal, writer and guest. Everyone applauds as Raymond walks into the room. The room is filled with famous faces. The walls are adorned with pictures and awards of some of Hollywood's biggest stars, both past and present. Angle on Sam Scott, a full-figured man with ponytail and dark eyeglasses. Chuck who's sucking up to anyone worth sucking up to, accompanies him. This is the next great one, the talk of the town, the savior. And no, no need to introduce. Anyone with a pulse knows who he is. Your, your last film was stupid. It, it, it hit me, hit me right here. Everyone in the hood knows you're the white man that knows what it's like to live in the ghetto. <laughs> Thank, thanks, I, I think, well, as you may already know, there's not a person in this town who's not, who just doesn't want, who's dying to work with you. I'm just glad Chuck trusted me to direct your first big project. You're directing? Yeah, thanks to Chuck. I got this one, and if Chuck has his way, I'll, I'll get the next one too. How come nobody talked to me? Now, now listen, I had to kiss a lot of ass to put this deal together and you don't have any plans of blowing it because if you, you know, you want to be important. So let me do my thing. Let you, why you've been doing. Stop. Um, Stop. Right now. Don't do this. Not here. Not now. Not ever. You're drawing attention to yourself. Now just take notes because this is the way things are done here. Stars drive the movie. And in our case, Sam Scott is driving this project. Without him, Ray Strip would land in development now. Got that? But Chuck. You're talking, not listening. I asked you to listen. 
Now, that's better. How do you think this deal is going to go down? Did you think that someone was going to put up $40 million on some 17-year-old black kid from Cleveland and just say, go out and make a movie? No, I don't think so. There's no affirmative action here in Hollywood. That, that's the problem. You have too much to say. There are no buts in this business. It's either it is or it isn't. Until Raymond turns a buck, we're going to do business the old fashioned way, their way. Cup walks away from James and makes his way over to Raymond. Raymond is talking to Cliff Berger, newly appointed talent agent at One, a powerful agency. Cliff is good looking and smooth talking, but he's good natured. No, I know you're signed with someone, but one day soon, you're going to have to move up with the big boys. And the only way to play hardball is to play with someone that's had more than just a couple of home runs. We hold the record. Take this. Call. Hey, what did he say? Ah, it doesn't matter. You know, you might be careful around here. There's a lot of sharks. Remember, Chuck's the one that got you here, okay? Interior, Sam Scott private room, night. Raymond and James are escorted into an impressive room. They're greeted by William Cressinger, vice president of Universal World Studios and James Bernard, Oscar nominated writer, producer. James greets everyone, but he's focused on the contract, which, brother, which bothers him. He attempts to get Chuck's attention. What are you doing? I don't like the way this reads. There's nothing to read. It's all standard stuff. Getting all worked over or nothing. Just, just sign. Sign off on it. I, I've taken care of everything. Um, excuse me. Is there a problem? Mr. Scott, gentlemen, I'm sorry. I don't want to be a killjoy, but there are, there are a couple of things from what I've read that for right now, just don't sit well with me. In fact, being that this is the first time I've gotten a chance to look over this contract, I feel that Raymond and I are at a disadvantage. Maybe if- Gentlemen, we... excuse me, let me talk for a minute. What did you think I was gonna do? Take your word and sign like I was some trained puppy? James, calm down. You've got yourself all worked up. Don't worry about all the little nuances. We're here to make the deal. Just help me seal this. And I promise you to make things right between you and me. What the hell's going on? What the, what the hell are you two doing? Just working things out, right, James? Look, I know what I'm about to say may throw a monkey wrench into your plans tonight, but there are some things that just aren't right. And as Raymond's friend and advisor, I think you should rework this deal to be more suitable for him. What the hell are you doing? It's sorry, Sam. This is a deal of a lifetime, and you want to chuck it just like that? Christ, you've got to be dumb to screw up a deal like this. Sign, sign, sign. Now, we got a deal. You can't do that. I can. I did. I just signed the contract with the kid, and that gives me the power of attorney, which means whatever I think, it's in the best interest of the kid. I can do whatever I want. We have a deal. Let's make a movie. You know, um, I think this can wait. Sam. I can smell a deal going south a mile away. I like the kids' work, so I think we should uh, all go out and uh, bring the New Year's in right. Tomorrow, I'll put some more qualified people on this to give it a once over, fill in some holes. <laughs> Does make a nice uh, coaster. Let's enjoy the party. Thank you for understanding. One by one, they exit the room. Each one sits their drink on the contract. As Chuck is about to leave, Sam blocks his way. And you, if you ever get that itch to call my office, don't. And that little thing you keep holding over my head every time you want something, I suggest you drop it before it comes back and bites you. Sam, wait. You know me. We go way back. 
give me a minute with the kid and, and, and I'll work things out. We'll wrap it up and sign it. Perfect, just like it back in the day. We got to forget whatever went down tonight, huh? You're a pathetic, lying, backstabbing little man. You know how much I hate when, when agents beg. I suggest you try your hand at selling insurance because when I put the word out on you tomorrow, you won't be able to rent a video in this town. Sam walks away and rejoins the party. Two very large men have been motioned to remove Chuck from the party. Angle on Chuck as he's being dragged out, kicking and screaming. It's an over. I'm the man. Without me, there's not a deal. Not that. There's not a deal. The deal's dead. The kid's mine. I got the contract. Day two. A young man jumps on top of a pair of oversized speakers. A silver screen is being lowered. On it is the countdown from Times Square. The waiter rushes to fill refill glasses with champagne. Raymond is standing off to the side, being entertained by Heidi and her twin sister, Hildy, both 21, supermodels. Raymond is being poured a glass of champagne while the, two, while the twins battle for his affection. James fights his way through the sea of party goers seeking Raymond. He calls out, but can't be heard because of the crowd and the loud music. We hear the countdown. He locates Raymond. Ten. Nine, eight. The twins are all over Raymond. James is still fighting to get through. Seven, six, five, four. James is nearly there. Three, two. We see Heidi is just about to kiss Raymond and James arrives just as the ball drops. Raymond is about to get his first Hollywood kiss. James pulls Raymond away. One, happy new year. Interior, Hollywood Hotel, night. James and Raymond enter the hotel lobby. It's raining and they're trying to dry off. A pretty desk clerk, desk clerk is trying to get James's attention. James walks over to the desk. It's New Year. You're back kind of early, aren't you? Yeah, I guess we're not the party people they thought we were. Well, you have a very important message. The lady wants you to call as soon as you get in. Uh, I hope everything's okay. If you need anything, I'm right here. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll keep that in mind. Interior, hotel elevator, night. Robin? No, from your mom. Interior, Raymond's hotel room, night. James dials the phone number. We hear the tone of the ringer. James looks at Raymond as he waits for Mrs. Neal to answer. The phone rings a couple of times more. Raymond is getting undressed. Let it ring. Someone's always home during the holiday. Dad got this strange superstition about being out with the crazies. Raymond goes to the bathroom. Interior, the Neal's house, night. Angela stands in the doorway. This scene is dark. The phone is ringing. She picks up the phone and begins to speak, tears streaming down the side of her cheeks as she begins to tell James her story. We can see the event play out. The conversation overlays the scene. We see Mr. Neal and a friend laughing as they exit the house get in the car and drive throughout the neighborhood. The street light turns from yellow to red, then the event. Hello? This is Neil. Happy New Year, it's James. It's Neil. It's okay? We see Mrs. Neil. We see Mr. Neil as his car pulls up to the light. The light is red. As Angela speaks to James, Every word spoken is playing out in flashback as they speak. It's, it's my husband. What happened? Is he all right? I don't know why this is happening. 
please, please try to calm down. Tell me what's going on. Come on. It's all right. I'm right here. Whatever it is, I know we'll get through it. I need you to try to calm down. You see the police at her door. She breaks down in one of the officer's arms. The police came and said that there has been an accident. They were just kids. He said they, they ran the light. They had to cut the bodies from the car. Raymond steps out of the bathroom just as the tail end of the call. James just looks at him as he listens to Angela on the phone. Hey man, he's gone. Oh my lord, why did they take away my man, James, why? Raymond realizes something has happened. Tears fill his eyes and he drops to his knees on one side of the bed, dragging the covers as he buries his head into the pillow. I'm, uh, I'm I'm so sorry. We'll be on the next flight out. Try to get some rest. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you, Mrs. Neal. I love you. James hangs up the phone. Ray, I don't know how to say this, but your dad was in a bad accident. How, how bad is it? As bad as it could be. Your mom said you never saw it coming. I'm sorry. Raymond pushes himself free and begins throwing around in a fit of rage. No, no, he can't be dead, you're lying. You, you tell me it's not true, please. James, say it ain't true, please. Raymond bolts out of the room barefoot, wearing only his tux pants and shirt. James runs out behind him. Ray, wait, where do you think you're going? Christ. Interior, hallway of hotel, night. Raymond stands at the elevator, frantically pushing the elevator button. James turns to the corner, calling him back. Just as Raymond sees him, he bolts down the stairwell with James behind him. Interior, hotel stairwell, night. Raymond runs down flight after flight, which eventually leads to the lobby. Interior, hotel lobby, night. Raymond exits the stairwell. He stumbles to the floor, then regains his footing. He pushes his way through a sea of late night party goers, then out onto the street into the pouring rain. James is half out of, out of breath. He falls on the lobby floor, he gets up and pushes his way through the same sea of people that Raymond knocked down moments earlier. Exterior, street scene, night. James stands in front of the hotel in the rain, still dressed in his tux. He spots Raymond running out of control. Raymond, come back! James runs down the dark, wet road, totally winded. He stops to catch his breath. He clutches his chest. Two strangers walk by and try to assist, but James waves them away. He looks, but no Raymond. Oh God, can you made me just a little faster? Raymond, come on, man, we gotta go home. Come on, Ray, answer me. He runs blindly through the rainy street. He stops at a phone booth to call for help. Interior, phone booth, night. He dials 911. While he waits for an answer, he rests his head on the glass. He sees a figure in the dark sitting on the curb, feet ankle deep in a puddle. His head is buried in his hands. James hangs up the phone and walks over to Raymond. He removes his rain-soaked jacket, places it over Raymond, and gently pulls him to his feet. Interior, James's hotel room, night. Raymond lays in bed asleep, 
tossing and turning. James, call, James calls Robin for comfort. He stands in the window, face against the glass. James? Mm -mm. What time is it? I'm sorry. I know it's late, but I need someone to talk to. Baby, what's wrong? Uh, Ray's dad died. He was in an accident. Two kids had one too many, ran away and killed him and his friend. Oh no, my God. Does Raymond, Ray know? Yeah, yeah, he's, he's asleep right now. I, I just called to let you know we're on the way. Next flight, back home. What about you? You were as, close to him. As James begins to break down, dissolve from one scene to another, we see them board the plane in LA, the silent plane ride home, the landing of the plane in Cleveland, and the sad welcoming party of six, two, Mrs. Neal and Robin. Robin never speaks to James, but, com but comforts Ray. What about you? You were close to him. Interior, LAX, night. This whole thing was my fault. If I would have left him alone. Interior, plane, night. And we are going to end it there so that we'll have time for a uh, talk back so I can have all the actors and the writer come back on screen. Thank you so much for this. You did a fantastic time. We had um, more script than we had time. Uh, so, but we anticipated this. These, that's the way these readings go. And uh, so do we have, yes, we have our writer, uh, Kevin, back on. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for sharing uh, your vision with us. And thank you, actors, for um, everybody. I think everybody got to at least do one or two of their roles. Uh, so, Kevin, um, what was the inspiration for writing this particular piece? Um, it, it started out um, a lot like you guys. I was struggling. Um, actor or working actor in New York. I had just arrived in New York and, and trying to understand the, the law of the lay of the land um, and trying to figure out how, how to break into this business as an actor. And I got lucky and got a couple parts and then realized there were challenges placed in front of um, um, actors trying to make it to the next level. And I realized that what I, what I wanted to do is how, how do I break into the business? And it's either you get discovered by someone you produce something, um, you direct something, you finance something, or um, you just get lucky. And uh, the screenplay basically mimics the, uh, the life of an actor and you know, chasing your dream is, what will you do in order to get a deal? What will you compromise? Will you sell yourself? Will you sell your soul? Um, what would you do? And my main character, um, that's question all through the movie. That, um, you know, what is he willing to get up give up in order to get a deal. And in a, um, a sea of desperation, he um, draws the last straw that he has and he manipulates the system that he thinks is gonna be in his favor, but he only discovers what the truth is, not only the truth of business, but within himself. So that was the motivation for the movie. So, um, and were there any surprises in hearing it read by the actors? Anything where you said, ah, oh, hadn't thought of it that way or, mm, Hmm, this is exactly what I thought. Um, it, it, it's, I, I'm going to tell you that there were some, some, some parts in there that uh, I, I was moved a lot more um, listening to it and seeing it played, um, especially James's uh, character. Um, and there were parts in it that made me cry. I mean, uh, it was amazing. And when Betty came in, uh, Mrs. Neal, um, a lot of it worked. A lot of it worked and I'm, you know, until you see your words and people play things out in, in life, your imagination runs wild. But um, clarity came in. This was, um, for me, this was a gift. I, I, I stopped taking notes and became a fan. I watched the movie. Great. And what are your pl next plans with this? Um, my next plan is to um, 
you know, probably go over and do a thorough rewrite and edit. Um, uh, I have a couple of opportunities of, um, you know, to, to at least introduce it and take it to the next level. Um, this helps because now you have a visual um, versus what's on the pages. So um, my, um, my dream is to see this on the big screen. And the way the, the, the landscape is right now, the opportunities, especially with black creatives, um, the opportunities are in my favor right now. So I'm, I'm excited and I am humbled and gracious and very thankful for everyone that has taken a part in this. And without my brother, Naheem, my sister, uh, Andrea, Denise and uh, David and uh, all these wonderful, wonderful, talented, real life actors, not just my friends reading this, real life talented people. Um, I, I bow down to, to you and I'm, I'm very thankful. Thank you for this opportunity. Sure, sure. We're thankful for your sharing your um, script. And what's your experience been so far? Well, I guess you've only had limited experience with Roxbury International Film Festival. Is is it this or have you attended any things online? Because you are not in Massachusetts. No, this this is the first time I, I've been to um, a, 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 any type of film, film festival at this level as far as a participant. I've been a guest at um, film festivals when I walk in and watch movies, whatever, but I've never been part of the film festival. So um, I, I, I'm over the top. I lost sleep last night anticipating what could happen, whatever. Um, as David Curtis told me last night, you know, are you ready? You know, and I said, yeah, I'm ready. Um, and believe it or not, I wasn't ready for this. This was, I, I got to go out and get the world ready for all you guys because you guys have greatness within you. Um, you guys are just wonderful, beautiful, talented people. Um, and it's not just my words. When you, you see your words being brought to life, um, not many people get a chance to see their dreams come true. Today, I got a chance to see my dream come true. Wonderful. And the actors, anybody have any comments or questions or anything? Any of the actors? Looks like I guess I guess I should say something. If you could raise your hand or or whatever. Yes, Naheem. Um so uh yeah, I, 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 so too bad we had to turn uh, finish early because towards the ending part, that's really the the meat of the of the whole piece. Um and the and the main character um coming to grips with the fact that he he was not willing to sell him stuff out for this project and he wants to make some wrongs right. So we 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 in the future we'll know how to do this better with you. But uh it was a great piece. Um I'm glad that you got to hear it. I'm glad that you get a chance to fix it and prepare it so that it could really be done. And uh, and I pray that it gets done. And to all you actors, you are wonderful. You are really, really, well, we got some real good talent in Boston. Yes, I'm very yes. proud. Uh, Josh, I, I, I love it. It's, you know, you said to me one day, I can't wait to work with you. And, and we've been working and now we're getting ready to do some more work. So Josh O and the rest of you, Excellent, excellent work. Very good work. Thank you. Thank you. Making Roxbury International Film Festival Daily Reads look real good. And I'm so, like I said, I'm sorry I had to cut it off, but I wanted uh, Kevin to be able to get feedback and to be able to talk about it. And Chris, you, Chris Defer, you had your hand up. Is it, did you take it down because you didn't have a question anymore? Or? Oh, let me have, uh, hit it for me. It was basically the ending of the uh, play was beautiful. I, I was really looking forward to that. Sorry. But <laughs> okay, um, I'll tell you what, um, Kevin, if you should ever want to do some more work with the old Kool Aid, man, let me know. Let me know. <laughs> All right, I will definitely do that, David. Uh, yes, um, I had like 15 questions. Um, what else do you have going on, Kevin? Um, Luckily today, um, I, I am at, at a point in my career, I'm, I'm writing and illustrating a book that um, I did for my sister. I'm actually meeting with um, the attorney for Tyler Perry at, at two o'clock. They're going to do give me some assistance and some direction on where I should go. Um, and then, you know, I, I do my daily podcast and my weekly podcast with you guys. So um, I'm going to continue to write. I mean, listening to, the, um, to my play. 
Um, just was an exclamation point that I should continue to, to master my craft in, in writing because I, I think um, I, I, I have a gift. And, you know, if you guys want me to give a summarize of the, the parts that we, we didn't read, um, I can go ahead and, and, and do that. You know, if you guys are open to it. Sure. All right, real, real quick, while, while Raymond is, um, we're, we're watching the scenes play out while they're traveling back from LA to Cleveland. Um, Robin has been in a situation that every man that she's ever encountered had lied to her. And Raymond had basically put together um, a scheme to put uh, James Anthony as a screenwriter since he was a youth. And he is a displaced Hollywood writer and moved back to Cleveland. So throughout the whole story, Raymond has been, I mean, James Anthony has been trying to tell Robin the truth, but every single time um, the opportunity presents itself, Robin brings up um, one of those horror stories of how a man has let her down and he did not want to be one of those men. So everyone knows about um, James and Raymond's relationship with the exception of Robin. And so in a moment of weakness, he confesses to um, Robin what the truth is. And Robin goes from um, grieving the loss of um, uh, Raymond's fa father to now feeling betrayed again. And so when Raymond, when James goes back to two jobs and six back, they said, you should have told her a long time ago. And all he wants to do is go back to his normal life. So the whole story summarizes about what are you willing to compromise within yourself in order to give a deal? And at this point, he loses everything that's important to him, including Raymond, the deal, and the girl he loves. Thank you. And we have a question for, or a comment from Lisa and a question. Uh, Lisa Seymour Terry says, love the layered conflicts and, and how the action progresses. How are the values played out in terms of conflict and love, including self-love and respect? And then she said, I think you just answered it. So, yeah. she, but she had her comments also. Thank so. you. Basically, you did. <laughs> Any? Yeah, but there, uh, there's a twist to the ending, though. There's a surprise ending. Oh, okay. All righty. And uh, Joshua. Yes, yes. I saw when I was reading it for the first time, I saw a twist where we find out uh, Raymond isn't the one who wrote uh, this, this uh, great script, you know. And then that was a twist in itself that I didn't see coming. And in my mind, I'm thinking that, okay, towards the end of the story, you know, Chuck, in my mind, was painted as this kind of uh, bad guy who really was influencing the negativity of the business and perpetuating that when uh, James was really looking out for Raymond in a way. And in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, it's going to go this way and that way. But what you just explained is like, oh, wow, it's like a, you know, that's a whole new way of, of looking at it for me. But I, I think this is a, I think this is a great story, man. And uh, thank you, yeah, thank you. Yeah, because yeah, he has a moment. He has the moment where he, he 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 with Sam calls the 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 director calls him and says, "Hey, man, you know, I heard what happened. I like the kid. I like the story. But we're gonna keep the lie. <laughs> we gotta keep the yeah. lie. We're gonna we're gonna sell the 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 the, the deal is not." you in the story the deal is the hype the kid the 17 year old kid wrote this story the 17 year old black kid wrote this story that's the hype that's what we're going to go with and he tells mm -hmm. him this is the way we're going to do it and it's nice to see james at the end when he says okay i understand but when he gets to the end he says i can't i can't and then that was that was that was nice yeah so 2020 hindsight if we'd started it later you might have been able to get uh, the thing. We, lo we live and we learn. <laughs> a 30 minute um, read, and we gave it 40 minutes, but it's a 30 minute read. So, you know, you only have so much time to get your stuff in. So, but, but you, 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 you guys did a great job in the parts that, that um, you, you did. And there's so many other um, parts in there. There are a lot of social issues. You, you hit on the, the drunk driving issues. You know, Chuck's original character, he is. In the beginning of the story, which you guys read at your film festival, he's washed up. He's a has-been. And when you see the, the in, introduction to Chuck, is like he's being kicked out of his um, um, apartment in New York, and he gets that one phone call, and he sees that manuscript, and it happens to be um, James Anthony's script with Raymond's name on it, and all of a sudden, lights go off. And he is represented 
some of the biggest stars in Hollywood, but he's lost them to bigger agencies just because Chuck's a buffoon. Mm -hmm. So these so, reads are always only a snippet of, um, almost always, uh, just a snippet. If it's a full length, then it's only a snippet of that full length. And you only choose one little snippet that you're going to um, show. It's never going to be the whole thing unless, like yesterday with uh, David J. Curtis, he had a full piece. Was it a full piece or was that? Yeah, that was a full piece. It was a short piece. play. Yeah. So um, some people have, have that, but you're always only going to get a, a snippet. And I just, I'm going to get to you, Josh, with your hand up. But first, I want to say Renee said, wonderful job, everyone. And uh, Raymond, I get maybe it's your brother or something, said, nice big, bro oh, yeah. I'm guessing it's his brother because it's his nice big brother, <laughs> big brother love. If you're an inspiration to, to your little brother trying uh, to, to fight the tears at the gym. Oh, and well, Dale Appel said wonderful work. So, Oh, Josh put his hand down. So didn't Naheem put his hand down? Uh, no, I, I, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, uh, Otis, you're no longer Otis. You're now Chuck. You, you read the hell out of that Bob boy. <laughs> yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. <laughs> I, I I believe I loved everybody's renditions. I mean, I totally believed your characters, you know, and some, you know, stagehand was entirely different from Mrs. Neal. Sorry, you never got to be Betty, but we already know you would have been fantastic as Betty because we already saw what you could do. Um, uh, David. Um, I just wanted to say that I was pleasantly surprised by what everyone gave. It was a joy to hear and watch everyone uh, immerse themselves in the characters. You know, to those who are my colleagues, it was such a joy to, to see you work. You know, I know we don't get a chance to work together often, but when we do see you, when I do see your work, it's like, oh my God, that's right. I forgot how he or she is so damn good. You know, well, I so, thank applause. David and Naheem for their casting. I was thank you, thank you, thank you, all of our actors and our writer for a wonderful, wonderful session today. And Big shout out to Daniel yesterday. 